The title of our sermon this morning is God's Just Judgment. God's Just Judgment. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, our primary text. And today, as we come to this subject, we're continuing our, our study of the essentials. One sermon, one hour, one introduction to one fundamental or foundational subject, which is, we believe, essential to the understanding, growth, and maturity of the believer. And as we last discussed man's fall into sin, uh, we now come to a consideration of the punishment of sin and God's righteous, God's just judgment. It is a solemn and sobering subject. There is soon coming a day when God will judge every person by the righteous standard of his perfect law, which is holy, just, and good. There is soon coming a day when God will judge every person by the righteous standard, the perfect standard of his holy law, which is holy, just, and good. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. We'll look at several texts today. We'll begin with Acts 17. We're in Acts 17. Drop down with me to verse 22. The apostle Paul stands in the midst of the Areopagus on Mars Hill about to address the pagan worldly philosophers of Athens. Paul's spirit is provoked within him. He is given now to indignation, a righteous, angry <laughs> anger, a righteous indignation, seeing that the city has been given over to idolatry. And he says to them, beginning in verse 22, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Now Paul preaches to them then on Mars Hill about the one who created all things, the world and everything in it. Paul preaches how he is Lord of heaven and earth, how he gives life and breath to all things, how in him we live and move and have our being. And then he turns to them in their idolatry and he says to them in verse 30, truly these times of ignorance God has overlooked. That is, God has not brought immediate judgment upon man for his sin. God's been patient. God's been long-suffering. In his forbearance, God has passed over sins which have been previously committed, verse 30, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, commands all men everywhere to turn from their sin, to turn from their sin. God has been patient to this point. God has passed over the sins previously committed, but now, at this point in redemptive history, as a result of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a result of his sacrifice on the cross, the institution or the establishment of the new covenant, God now commands all men, everyone, everywhere, must repent. Why? Verse 31. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, and he has given assur assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So how did the worldly wise of Athens respond then to Paul's sermon that day on Mars Hill? How did they respond? A few of them, it says, believed Paul. Some of them believed and joined him. Others said they wanted to hear more. We'll hear more, on you, uh, more from you on this matter. Others, when they heard talk of the resurrection, they mocked. They mocked. So it is in our day when we preach this truth, isn't it? Some will believe. Many of you are here today. Testimonies of those who would believe. Some, are, some will say, I'll hear more on this matter. I'll keep coming for a while. And others scoff and others mock. Acts chapter 24, verse 15. There will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. There will be a resurrection. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. There will be a resurrection of the dead. There will be a judgment at the end of the age. God has given assurance of this to all by raising the man whom he's ordained, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God has appointed a day on which he will hold you and I accountable for our sin against him. And all men, 
All people everywhere, young, old, all will face judgment. Don't mistake God's patience with sinners as tolerance for sin. We will face judgment before Jesus Christ the righteous. And God has proven this to all by raising him from the dead. And when we preach that subject, people laugh, they mock, they continue on in their sin, disregard the warnings, suppress the truth in their unrighteousness, heap scorn upon those who would preach it, and they continue in their sin. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter, Hebrews, James, Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3, and look there at verse 3. There will always be scoffers, those who will cast scorn upon this doctrine, will neglect this doctrine, will reject this doctrine. There will all be, always be scoffers. Peter, verse 3 says, The scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, verse 4, and saying, Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Right? These scoffers, they know of the Lord's promise to return. They've heard that taught before. They've heard it preached. They know that there is a promise of the Lord's return. But then they mock this promise as false. Why? Because they'd rather, verse 4, walk according to their own lusts. They'd rather walk according to their own lusts. They throw off any thought of judgment because they'd rather walk according to their own lusts. Look at verse 5. For this, this doctrine, they willfully forget. It's not that they didn't know about it, didn't hear about it. They willfully forget it. They willfully block it out of their mind, right? They obstinately clench their eyes closed to keep from seeing it. They obstinately stop their ears to keep from hearing it so that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. In other words, there in verse five, by the word of his power, by the word of his power, God created the heavens and the earth. It was by that same word of his power that then God sent judgment upon the earth. And though he will never again destroy the wicked with a flood, it will be by the same word of his power that he will bring a judgment at the end of the age by fire. God will judge the world. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, now preserved by the word of his power, right? Are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. What is Peter saying? Peter's saying the end is most certainly coming. God is not slack concerning his promise, right? He's not slow or negligent. He's not sleeping on the job, so to speak. God will be true to his word. There is a judgment coming, and God's not going to be slack about it. He's not going to be slow about it. It's coming. He's patient. Now is the time for patience. But God's just judgment and the ultimate punishment for sin is coming for the ungodly. Our confession of faith, the London Baptist, Second London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, states it this way in chapter 32, article 2. The end of God's appointing this day is for the manifestation of the glory of his mercy. Now notice what it says. It's this day, this one judgment, this day of judgment. It is the day of the Lord. The end of God's appointing this day is for the manifestation of the glory of his mercy in the eternal salvation of the elect and for manifesting the glory of his justice in the eternal damnation of the reprobate who are wicked and disobedient. For then shall the righteous go into everlasting life and receive that fullness of joy and glory with everlasting rewards in the presence of the Lord. But the wicked, listen, who know not God and obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be cast aside into everlasting torments and punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. God's judgment, eternal torment, everlasting destruction is a truth that is virtually unthinkable to the natural man. Virtually unthinkable. It 
assaults his pride, and so he scoffs. It chafes against fallen reason, and so he scoffs. Men, for all millennia, since the beginning of time, have denigrated and despised the justice, justice of God's judgment and his sentence against impenitent, unrighteous sinners. And listen, not merely scoffers, not merely scoffers, not merely self-professed unbelievers, atheists, and agnostics, but many professing Christians have dismissed this doctrine as offensive or untrue. They despise the thought of hell. It's a terrifying thought, isn't it? You meditate on hell for just a moment. It is a terrifying, horrific reality. A terrifying reality. Eternal torment. Everlasting punishment. And many professing Christians have difficulty with this doctrine. I read an op-ed in the New York, New York Times last month from a professing Christian who actually built a case blaming the obvious to him, the obviously unthinkable concept of eternal torment he blamed on the, the pride-fueled cruelty of Christians. Sought to blame this concept of hell that he thought unthinkable. Blamed that on Christians. Listen to what he says. How can we be winners after all if there are no losers? In other words, how can we enjoy the blessings of heaven if there aren't those suffering the torments of hell? <laughs> Where's the joy in getting into the gated community in the private academy if it turns out that the gates are merely decorative and that the academy has an inexhaustible scholarship program for the underprivileged, this guy's a universalist, right? believes that everyone will be in heaven. He says, what success can there be that isn't validated by another's failure? That's why Christians have dreamt up this doctrine of hell that results in everlasting torment for the ungodly. What heaven can there be for us without an eternity in which to relish the impotent envy of those outside its walls. Wow. Wow. So often, professing believers are guilty of subjecting what is revealed in the Scriptures to a man's fallen reason. We have a tendency to say, that doesn't sound right to me. And so we subject the Word of God, and what is revealed in the Word of God, we subject it to our own reason. What we think, what we feel, what we believe is right, we subject the Word of God to our opinions. And many absolutely will not tolerate the thought of an eternal punishment. We find all kinds of ways to excuse it away. I remember one time I read a book, 400 some odd pages, on why hell is not eternal. <laughs> It took 400 pages to make the argument against all the texts in the Bible that specifically say that hell is eternal. It is just so odious, to use my brother's word, odious to us, this doctrine of eternal judgment. Sin has so darkened our understanding, darkened our understanding of righteousness, darkened our understanding of sin, of holiness, of justice, of judgment, of goodness, darkened our understanding of truth, that we simply can't see the full weight and measure of our guilt before God. We are fallen creatures. We have to remember that we are creatures and that our minds are darkened. Our understanding is darkened. We simply don't see the way that we're supposed to see. We don't fathom the exceeding sinfulness of sin. We don't come to grips with the exceeding sinfulness of sin. We must Submit our understanding to the word of God and what God says is the exceeding sinfulness of sin. We don't fathom the infinite holiness of God. Our standard of justice, because of these things, our standard of justice is corrupt. Our standard of justice, our standard of what is right and wrong is perverted. It's perverse because of our sin. Then we take our own perverted sense of justice and we attempt to impose that standard, our own standard of justice, our own standard of sin and its guilt, and we attempt, we attempt to impose that standard, that benchmark upon God. And worse yet, worse yet, what is that man writing the op-ed in the New York Times? What is he really saying? He's blaming God. He's saying that that punishment is cruel. He blames it on Christians, but ultimately... 
he stands opposed to God. We charge him with cruelty for what the Bible clearly teaches as just. We must submit our understanding to the word of God. We have to acknowledge that we are fallen creatures. We have to acknowledge that we see as in a glass dimly and that our, our understanding, our sense of right and wrong, our sense of justice and guilt and sin and holiness is woefully inadequate. We must submit our reason, our understanding to the word of the living God. We must acknowledge that we often do not understand. We must acknowledge that his thoughts are not our thoughts, that his ways are not our ways. As high as the heavens are from the earth, so high are his thoughts than our thoughts, his ways than our ways. But the word of God on this subject, as it is on every subject that the word of God addresses, is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And God's word has much to say, much to say about this subject. And listen, we need to know it and we need to preach it. <laughs> It is often lost among preachers of God's word today. Very few churches will you hear it talked about. Very few Christians will deal with it. Certainly those that attempt to preach the gospel are timid and fearful and shy away from it. It is a dreadful reality. And Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Well, what does God's word say? What does God's word say about God's just judgment and the punishment for sin? Listen to this from Paul in Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Listen. Therefore, Paul says, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes, who puts their faith and trust in him, right? Everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. In other words, you're saved by grace through faith in Christ. Not saved by your works. If you attempt to be right with God by keeping the works of the law, you are hopelessly destitute of any righteousness because you've sinned by breaking the very law that you're hoping will gain you merit with God. You're a sinner. You are void of any righteousness of your own. But it is through the Lord Jesus Christ that we preach forgiveness of sins. There is forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you will turn from your sin, put your faith and trust in him, then you can be forgiven of your sins, cleansed of your unrighteousness. You can be given the very righteousness of God in him and declared righteous in God's sight as though you had not sinned. Your guilt wiped away, clean by the blood of the lamb. Amen? It is by this man that is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. By him, everyone who believes is justified. What does Paul say? So then, so then, beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, Paul warns, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. What's the work that he's speaking of? He's speaking of the work of God's judgment. Speaking of the work of God's judgment. God, in his mercy, in his grace, has provided a substitutionary sacrifice for sinners. The Lord Jesus Christ lived as a man on this earth. He took on the mud of our existence. He walked, born under the law, a sinless, perfect life sinless, perfect, he goes to the cross. And there he suffers and he dies bearing the wrath of God that you and I deserve. He bears the wrath of God on himself, on his body, on the tree, and suffers the eternal wrath, the undiluted wrath and fury of God against sin upon himself for his people. That's God's provision for sin. His only begotten son if God will do that to his only begotten son, what will he do to the ungodly who reject him? The Lord warns, Paul warns in Acts chapter 13, listen, it's by this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God, that forgiveness of sins is preached. Hear him, trust him, turn to him in faith and be saved, be forgiven. And if you do not, if you forsake God's one provision for sin, if you reject God's one provision for mercy and forgiveness and grace in him, then beware, 
Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Marvel and perish, God says. I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, even though someone were to tell it to you. In other words, hell, judgment, is such a fearful, terrifying reality that our fallen minds, our, our fallen understanding, simply can't grasp it. We can't grasp eternity, and yet hell is eternal. We can't grasp the punishment that our sin deserves, and yet that punishment is everlasting. Paul is warning scoffers of God's coming judgment and the righteous punishment that awaits impenitent, unrighteous, ungodly sinners. It is an outpouring of judgment that is unbelievable. That's what Paul is saying. I work a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to tell it to you. It will arouse shock. It will arouse horror. And in the midst of that, Paul holds out hope here through the gospel. Turn to faith in Christ. Well, how does the word of God then describe God's just judgment and the punishment of the wicked? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. The text read earlier in your hearing. Revelation 20. How does the word of God describe this judgment? We see it in this text, Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 11. The word of God says, this is through John. Then I saw, verse 11, a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose faith, face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Notice first with me from Revelation chapter 20 verse 11, the judge. Notice first the judge. Then I saw a great white throne. A king sits on a throne. Amen. A throne is a place of authority, a place of rule and reign, a place of judgment. I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. The judge is seated on the throne of his glory in verse 11, the throne of his judgment. We know from several texts in the Bible that this one seated on the throne is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The prophet Daniel describes this time, describes him in chapter 7 verse 9, where Daniel in a vision sees... I watched till, till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands of thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, describing the scene, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The court is seated. The books are opened. The Lord enters into judgment. There is no higher judge. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. There is no higher court. There is no higher throne. There is no higher court of appeals. No case can further be made. This is the final judgment. Notice next the judged in verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. In other words, standing before God the Son, who was seated on the throne of his judgment. Every person who ever lived, both small and great. In other words, no one escapes judgment. No, not one. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 
Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. In the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 27, God the Father gives God the Son authority to execute judgment. And it's because God the Son is the Son of Man. And he gives Jesus Christ all authority as the Son of Man to execute judgment. And John says this in verse 27, listen. Do not marvel at this. For the hour, the hour, you see, the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So it makes no difference who you are. Makes no difference where you were born or who you were born to. Young, old, middle-aged, Somebodies and nobodies, kings and paupers, wealthy and poor, the rich man and Lazarus. The Lord is no respecter of persons. He shows no partiality. And the scope of his jurisdiction extends to every single human being who has ever lived. Doesn't matter how you died or what happened to your body. Doesn't matter how you rem your remains were disposed of, whether you were at sea, whether you were buried in the earth, whether you were cremated or burned at the stake. In verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades, or the grave, the state of death, the grave delivered up the dead who were in them. In other words, the places of the dead gave back their dead. And small and great, all of them alike, stand before God. Stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, sitting on the throne of his judgment. The judge, the judge, notice finally the judgment in verse 12. The judgment in verse 12. I saw the dead small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And we hold to the great doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. We believe that. Amen? We are saved by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. We rejoice that our salvation is not by works. Why? Because if our salvation was, was by works, we would all be doomed. We'd all be damned. We would all be cast into the lake of fire. <laughs> We'd all suffer eternal torment because there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who does good, no, not one. We rejoice that our salvation is not by our works. But sometimes embracing and meditating on that doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone can sometimes lead the Christian to forget that works are also important. <laughs> or sometimes might lead the Christian to believe that maybe works aren't important at all, when in fact the Bible says differently. We will all be judged, verse 12, according to our works. Do you see? According to what is written in the books, we'll be judged according to our works. Verse 12 doesn't tell us what the first books are, we can surmise that from Scripture. Malachi speaks of a book of God's remembrance, which God forgets absolutely nothing. <laughs> God is omniscient, nothing forgotten by God. There's a book of God's remembrance. Matthew Henry speaks of the book of God's omniscience, the book of our conscience, what is written in our minds and our heart. It's said, the brain being a, just a wondrous, a masterfully crafted creation of God, is far greater than any computer, that we don't forget anything. It's stored there somewhere, back in the recesses of our mind. All that will be brought to the forefront at the judgment. Nothing escapes his sight. We are laid bare before him with whom we must give an account. Naked. Certainly the book of his law will be opened and we are judged by the law. That's Romans chapter 1. We'll be judged by the law. This all means that men's opinions are irrelevant. You have no case. I remember when I would get in trouble, and maybe some of you parents can relate to this, and I would come with my case before my dad, right? Before his, and he, the first word came of it, out of his mouth, I'm defending myself and trying to explain what I had done and why I had done it. You have no case, no case. The mouth of every person will be stopped all the world is guilty before God, Romans chapter 3. 
Henry again. Let it be our great concern to see on what terms we stand with our Bibles. Whether they justify us or condemn us now. For the judge of all will proceed by that rule. Christ shall judge the secrets of all men according to the gospel. Happy are those who have so ordered and stated their cause according to the gospel as to know beforehand that they shall be justified in the great day of the Lord. Know where you stand with your Bible. Notice also, though, in verse 12, that the book of life is opened. Speaking of the gospel, the book of life is opened. Daniel says this in chapter 12, verse 2. And at that time, your people, God's people, shall be delivered. Every one who is found written in the book, all those whose names are recorded in the Lamb's book of life, from before the foundation of the world, will be delivered. They'll be delivered. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Another perspective on this judgment. Matthew chapter 25. Beginning there at verse 31. The judge, the judged, and the judgment. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. Notice all these texts come together on that point. This is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in his glory. He sits on the throne of his glory. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him. All the nations of the peoples, right? Not just the Jews. All of the nations will be gathered before Him. All those people, a mass number of people, small and great, standing before the Lord in judgment. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Wait a minute, I thought that salvation was by faith alone, in Christ alone. Yes, but not by a faith that is alone. This is not a salvation by works. This is a salvation that works. You did these things, they are fruits of faith. Do you see? The righteous, verse 37, will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? Right? The Lord's not with us now. When did we ever do that for him? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Notice God judges the righteous according to their works. Not because the righteous are saved by their works, but because salvation produces works. It's not a salvation by works. It is a salvation that works. Jesus said, didn't he, that by their fruits, you will know them. By their fruits, you will know them. That flies in the face of much preaching today. If you walk an aisle, say a prayer, ask Jesus into your heart, then you're saved. <laughs> no fruits necessary. You go out and live like a pagan, well, if you are sincere, if you meant it when you said that prayer, then you're in. No, by their fruits, you will know them. Where do you find those fruits? What do you see as fruits? What does the Bible teach that are those fruits by which we may know that we are living by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? You find those in the word of God. You find those in the word of God. It's the fruit of a changed life, the fruit of a changed heart. The righteous are righteous precisely and only because they have trusted alone in the perfect life and perfect obedience and perfect death, perfect sacrificial penalty-paying death of Christ for them. They are righteous and only righteous because of that. It is not their righteousness by which they are righteous, but by his righteousness. Verse 41, then 
He will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. You see the contrast here, don't you? Same language. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they will also answer him saying, Lord, Lord, right? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Everlasting punishment. Everlasting, right? Just punishment, righteous punishment, do their own wretched unbelief and sin. It is a righteous judgment. That judgment's coming. What is the nature of it? What's the nature of God's sentence against sin? What is the nature of that punishment? The Bible refers to the place of this everlasting punishment for sin as hell. The name given is hell or Gehenna. You'll see the word Gehenna used in Scripture. It's interesting to note that the one who spoke most clearly and most frequently of this subject in the New Testament was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And most often, then, in his earthly ministry, in the Gospels, we find more about hell, Gehenna, eternal punishment, everlasting punishment, in the Gospels. It's a recurrent theme that runs through the preaching and teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the nature of that punishment for sin? What is it like? What is it like? First, it's everlasting. It is everlasting. A place of unending punishment. A place of unending torment. Look at verse 46. Verse 46. These will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now notice in verse 46, if you're reading a New King James, the two words translated everlasting and eternal, both of those are the same word in Greek. They're the same word in Greek. Ionion. Ionion. It means that as eternal as the life is, is as eternal as the punishment is. Do you see? We like to think of everlasting life, eternal life. God uses the same word to describe punishment. It is an eternal, everlasting, unending torment. In the same way that our life in Christ is everlasting, life in hell is everlasting. It is everlasting. Second, It is a place of torment and woe. It is a place of torment and woe. The two terms used by the Lord to describe the torments of hell, he describes it as a place of fire and as a place of outer darkness. A place of fire and outer darkness. Both is where there will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. In verse 41 It's the everlasting fire. Look back up at Matthew chapter 25, verse 30. Look back up at verse 30. The Lord is teaching the parable of the talents. And what becomes of the unprofitable servant in verse 30? He casts the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. The weeping, the gnashing. In the Greek, there's the article there. It's not weeping and gnashing. It's the weeping and the gnashing. It's as if to say, this is the ultimate of all weeping and the ultimate of all gnashing. That all that you have wept over in this life, all of the woe, all of the adversity, all of the difficulty, all of the sadness, all of the shame, all of the weeping in this life is a mere foretaste of the weeping in that life. It's a mere shadow of what will be the substance of the weeping that will last into eternity. The gnashing. A similar word is used when Stephen is preaching in the temple. 
in Acts chapter 7 before he's martyred. And Stephen turns to those self-righteous, hypocritical, envious Pharisees. And he says, you murdered the just one. You are his murderers. And the Bible says that they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Now, if you can imagine, now they take Stephen and take him out and stone him to death immediately. They stone him to death in their anger. They gnashed at Stephen with their teeth. This is the gnashing. All of that anger, all of that hostility, all of that bitterness, all that resentment, all of that vitriol stored up on this side of eternity is merely a foretaste of that gnashing of teeth that will last into eternity. It is the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Flip back and look at Matthew chapter 22, just a couple of pages to the left. Matthew chapter 22. This is the parable of the wedding feast. The king has arranged a marriage, a wedding feast for his son, and guests are invited to the feast. Notice what happens in verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here into the feast, into this marriage celebration? How did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless, had no case. Then the king said to the servants in verse 13, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Many are called, few are chosen. This speaks here of the marriage supper of the Lamb, a great feast, a celebration of joy amongst God's people, right? When the bride is united to her bridegroom, the saints will be there, unspeakable, inexpressible joy, and the one without a wedding garment, the one who is not clothed in the white linen robes of Christ's perfect righteousness, that one is cast out. And notice, he's cast out into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's cast into outer darkness. Flip back a few pages to the left, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And look there beginning at verse 8. In verse 8, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, listen, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. In Matthew chapter 22, it was outer darkness. Here it is everlasting fire. Verse 9, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Hellfire. Here the word is Gehenna. The word is Gehenna. It's described as outer darkness and hellfire or everlasting fire or the furnace of fire or in this case, Gehenna. Gehenna was a dump just outside the western gate of the city of Jerusalem. It was in the valley of Hinnom, the valley of Tophet, where the Israelites in their history had made their children walk through the fire to the god Moloch. They had sacrificed their children in the fire to this wicked, pagan, idolatrous god Moloch. And there, that valley where they did that was cursed. It became a trash heap on the outskirts of Jerusalem. All of the refuse from the city, dead people, dead animal, animals, animal parts, human refuse, all thrown into Gehenna. Because of the perpetual stench of that place and because of the pollution, uh, because of the filth that, were there, that was there, they kept the fires in Gehenna burning constantly, nonstop. Nonstop fire, nonstop stench, nonstop filth, nonstop misery in the valley of Gehenna. Here, that serves as a symbol for what the Lord states here as hell. It stands as a picture, an earthly shadow, if you will, of a heavenly reality. What is the temple? 
The temple is a picture of God's communion with us. With us, The temple was made, the psalmist says, as a picture of heavenly realities. The temple, a picture of heavenly realities. Gehenna is a picture of hellish realities. Gehenna is a picture of hell. Here the Lord uses that name to depict hellfire. One of the aspects of everlasting torment in hell is privative. It means loss. Privative is when you're deprived of something. Hell, when it's spoken of as outer darkness, means a deprivation of that which is light, a deprivation of that which is good. They're deprived from the wedding feast and cast into outer darkness. It's privative. It deprives the guilty one, the guilty sinner of something good, that which is taken from them. The other aspect of everlasting torments in hell is punitive. It is an active, intentional, overt punishment for sin, that which is done to them. One speaks of deprivation, the deprivation of blessing, joy, peace, and comfort. One speaks of punitive, retributive torment inflicted upon the damned by God in his wrath and judgment against them. One deprivation, one is punitive. When I was punished as a kid, I could be sent to my room without dinner. That's privative. Or my dad could get out the leather belt. Punitive, right? I was once given a choice. Go to my closet, get a belt. I came back with his terry cloth robe belt. It was the last time I was ever given a choice. <laughs> and then I was sent to my room without dinner. Uh, you see the difference, right? Privative and punitive, both expressed by outer darkness, removed from all good, separated from all blessedness, separated from any joy, any hope, deprived of all blessings, cut off, the king will say to the sheep on his right hand, come, you blessed my father, inherit the kingdom, right? Prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Enter into the blessed joy of your Lord. But he'll say to the goats on his left, depart from me, you cursed. That's privative. Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire. That's punitive. He is cast out of the wedding feast, privative, where there will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. That's punitive. To be cast into outer darkness is to be cut off from the light. And who is the light of the world? The Lord Jesus Christ. Who is the light of men? The Lord Jesus Christ. There'll be no sun in the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. Why? Because he'll be its light. He dispels the darkness. Outer darkness is to be cut off from any and all blessedness. Cut off from any and all good. Darkness is the absence of any and all light. It is the opposite of blessedness or good due only to the redeemed. Jude refers to it as the blackness of darkness forever. And not only outer darkness, but everlasting fire. Everlasting fire. Matthew chapter 3, verse 10. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Chapter 3, verse 12, his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Chapter 7, verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Look back at Matthew chapter 13, a few pages to the left. Matthew chapter 13, look there beginning at verse 36. The Lord Jesus Christ has just taught the parable of the tares, the wheat and the tares. So in verse 36, Jesus sent the multitude away. He went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The field is not the church. The church is made up of God's people, a regenerate, Holy Spirit-indwelt people. Here, the field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy, verse 39, who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, 
As the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Fire, hellfire, is the expression of God's righteous wrath. Fire is the expression of his righteous anger. God sends fire. Listen to this. Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse 9. Listen. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Now how is that wrath expressed? How is God's indignation for all eternity expressed upon the unrighteous? God will glorify himself in the expression of his holy and eternally holy justice and his wrath against sin. How will God eternally and everlastingly display or manifest the glory of his just wrath, the glory of his justice? He will do it by expressing his judgment through fire. Listen, it's poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Their works follow them. Wrath comes to expression in the fire of God's judgment. It is everlasting. It is a place of torment and woe. It is both privative and punitive. It is universal. It is intensely personal. The Lord has given us his word. The Lord has told us the awful weight of sin. The Lord has explained exactly what is owing our sin, exactly what our sins and unrighteousness and ungodliness deserves. Do not go to the throne of his judgment unprepared. Solomon says that because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. You know, what stupid, ignorant, brute beasts we often are. If you take a dog and you punish them every time he makes a mess on the carpet, <laughs> a dog will learn to stop making a mess on the carpet. Solomon says, because... The sentence against an evil work, our own evil, the things that we do, the things that we think, the things that we say, things that we imagine, our evil. Because the sentence against that evil work is not executed right then, speedily, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. We have God's word to instruct us. We have God's word to warn us. If you're sitting here today, and you are not in Christ Jesus. You are without a wedding garment. You are without hope. You are without God in the world. If you were to die today, if you were to die today, you have no other court of appeal, 
There's nowhere else you can go. You will stand before God in judgment in the filthy rags of your own unrighteousness. You will be judged at the great white throne. You'll be judged by the king and he will cast you into outer darkness, into the furnace of fire where there will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth forever and ever. And the smoke of your torment arises forever and ever. The Lord has said that it is so. Why will you die in your sin? Why wouldn't you flee to Christ in all of this? Why does the Lord take such pains in his earthly ministry to time and time and time again teach us about judgment? Why does he continuously teach us about hell? Because hell is real. Hell is a reality. And many will go there. Many enter in by the narrow gate. Wide is the gate. Broad is the way which leads to destruction. And there are many on that path. Difficult is the way which leads to life. Few there are who find it. And here you are today hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ preached to you. Hearing the awful punishment that is due your sin, my sin. Will you not turn to Christ? Will you not turn from the destructive path that you are on? If you do not turn, you will burn. Do you see? There is one who has drank to the dregs that cup of indignation reserved for his people. He has consumed the cup of God's wrath to the full for those who had put their faith and trust in him. Jesus Christ bears the awful weight of our sin. Jesus Christ deals fully and finally with the guilt of our sin. Jesus Christ secures for us the righteousness that we need to stand before a holy God. Jesus Christ is the surety of our salvation. Put your faith and trust in him as your only hope. There's nothing you can do. Listen, if you continue to wallow in your sin, more and more, the Lord says, you'll become seared in your conscience, given over to that which you most want, to the point, at some point, when you can't turn from sin any longer, and you're given over to a debased mind. Turn from your sin. Brothers and sisters, this day is coming. What is the, the universal, it seems, admonition, exhortation with respect to this day for believers? We're to keep watch. We're to keep watch. Make sure you have oil in your lamps. Make sure your wicks are trimmed. Uh, be vigilant. Keep watch. This day will not overtake us uh, as those who walk in darkness. We are sons of the light. Um, live, live as those who are of the light. Looking forward to the return of our bridegroom. Amen. Time of joy. Let's take a moment and pray. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you are facing this judgment. Pray, flee to Christ for mercy. Brothers and sisters, thank the Lord that we have a righteous substitute, a Jesus Christ the righteous, an advocate with the Father, and let's rejoice in him and look forward to our day where we'll face him in judgment and Rewards will be doled out for those who walk in righteousness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray, please, Lord, bless these truths to our heart. Help us to be gripped with heavenly spiritual realities communicated so clearly, so fully in your word. I'm so grateful, Lord, to have your truth revealed to us. Help us, Lord, to not be swept up in all the distractions of this life, but to think on and ponder uh, that which is most important 
and the eternal destiny of our own destiny of our own soul. May sinners flee to the cross. May the saints, Lord, cling to you more tightly by faith, looking forward to that great day, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And may you be magnified and glorified in your justice and in your grace and in your mercy. You are worthy, Lord, of all praise, and we praise you and worship you now in this. In Jesus' name, amen.